hello and welcome to the video. Today it's all about saturation. I'm going to help you identify different types of saturation, how to really listen out for it. I've got plenty of examples and I want to deal with some audio myths and misconceptions about saturation. But most importantly, I want to show you how to use saturation in your mixes and productions to actually make them sound better. So for a full list of topics covered, check the description. But for now, let's just jump right into it. Saturation is a very broad effect, and it can be a deliberate and obvious effect, such as an overdriven guitar tone or a heavily distorted 808 bass sample, but it's also the more subtle side effect induced by signal processing. So virtually any circuit, tube, tape, transistor, or even plug-in has saturation to a certain degree, and it's this analog style saturation that I really want to concern myself with this video. All of these terms you hear thrown around, like warm, thick, silky, creamy, smooth, these terms that you hear audio engineers and also companies throwing out all the time in their marketing, that's the sort of saturation I want to address in this video. Part of the appeal or fascination with saturation is that as a lot of these devices are analog, records made back in the good old days often sounded really sort of warm, full, punchy and thick. And part of this is down to the fact that there was subtle saturation on every single track in those mixes, just naturally, due to the devices they were recorded on and mixed through. But let's get straight to some examples. So what actually is saturation? So it's basically when extra sound is induced or added to your original signal. And there's two main types of saturation or harmonic saturation, and these are even and odd harmonics. This first example is extremely simple, but it sets the groundwork for the later examples that will be a lot more musical. So to start with, I have a 100 hertz sine wave, and this is what we're going to call our fundamental. So on its own, it just looks and sounds like this. And what I'm going to do is induce even harmonics onto this signal. And these will be even multiples of that 100 hertz. So 100 times 2, 200 hertz, times 4, 400 hertz, etc. We'll come back to that in a moment, but now for the odd harmonics. These are odd multiples of the original signal, so in this case 100 times 3, times 5, 7, 9, and so on. And these look and sound like this. In both cases, we're adding signal or notes that weren't there previously, albeit at a slightly lower level, and these were often pushed into the higher frequencies. In general, the even harmonics tend to give a feeling of support and clarity and fullness, mainly because you're adding in that octave and another octave above as well, and adding the octave to the original sound sort of gives this feeling of support, maybe a subtle sort of feeling of doubling that original uh, sound that you had, whereas the odd harmonics definitely added a lot more richness, I would say a lot of edge, bite, and sort of buzziness to the sound, you had just a whole lot more high frequencies there. Now this is sort of general between even and odd harmonics, both can sound excellent depending on what you're using them for, it's not that one is better than the other. But there is another topic we have to address very quickly with this basic example, and that is that besides a few plugins and wave shapers, almost all plugins and certainly all analog hardware doesn't simply induce even or odd harmonics, as many people believe. All of these different devices and plugins have a different combination or distribution of these even and odd harmonics, depending on a lot of different factors. So you may well have heard that tubes have only even harmonics, and maybe tape has only odd harmonics, but this simply isn't true. It is true that certain devices favour certain harmonics, even or odd, but it's so much more than just whether it's got a tube in it, or whether there's a bit of tape there. Uh, from an engineering background, it's all to do with the topology of the circuit, not just the tube or the tape, it's every single piece of wire, every capacitor, especially the transformers make a huge difference. It's just the general design of the circuitry, and not just one component. I'll discuss a little bit more about that later, but the last topic I need to introduce is non-linearity, or non-linear behavior, which sounds confusing, but trust me, it's not that bad. So basically, with uh, any device that induces saturation or distortion, what you might expect is that at all levels of volume or gain that you feed into that device, 
you'd have exactly the same type of saturation, so the same distribution of even and odd harmonics, and you'd just get more or less volume of them. But this couldn't be further from the truth. What you actually see with almost all of these devices and plugins is that if you feed a different amount of volume into them, or if you drive them differently, you get dramatic differences in the distributions of odd and even harmonics and the tone of the saturation that's generated. So I have an example here with a tube emulation and you'll see that as I increase the amount of drive there's a big difference in the distribution of harmonics. At some points it's favoring those even harmonics, then the odd, then back to the even again. So you really have to be careful of this and just remember that these devices respond completely different to transients, different amounts of signal. So anyway, let's take a quick listen to this nonlinear behavior. I know that a pure sine wave is not a very musical way to represent saturation, but I really just wanted to keep it as simple as possible for those first three fundamental points, the even harmonics, odd harmonics, and then the non-linear behavior of these devices. So if any of that's confusing, please, you know, just take a break, come back to this, rewatch those sections. I think it's very important that you understand that before moving on. Moving on to some more fun examples, how do we actually hear this saturation, hear it in tracks, set it in our own tracks and productions, and what type of saturation do we even want to use at all, because there's so many different types. First thing, pop on some headphones, especially mixing and mastering headphones, you need something that can give you an extended high frequency response. Reference monitors are great in a well-treated room, but most of the time the subtle differences of saturation are a little bit harder to set correctly on studio monitors, whereas in headphones you can tend to hear if you're overdoing it a little bit too much. The next step is to get your hands on a lot of different options for saturation. There's tons of free plugins out there and stock ones. You need to experience a lot of these different plugins. It's one of these effects where there is no sort of wrong or right plugin. There's just so many of them and so many producers have tons of different analog gear and plugins, especially for this purpose. Particular tools tend to fit very particular jobs. The next thing is once you've got all of these plugins, if you're confused about what they're doing, simply download this span analyzer plugin that I was using earlier in the video. It's a free plugin. I'll link to my free plugins video in the description. You can simply run a pure sine wave through it and then see what your plugin is doing, what it's inducing. It can just give you a little bit more data, a little bit more information if you're unclear. The next thing you must do uh, when you're using saturation plugins or hardware is send in a good amount of signal. If you're, you know, sending in minus 30, minus 40 dB of signal, you might actually not experience any saturation with these plugins. As I explained earlier with the non-linear behavior, some of these plugins don't even react to anything until you give them minus 20, minus 10 dB of gain going into them, surprisingly. So Experiment with pushing up your gain going into the plugins. Make sure that you're maintaining really good gain staging. And now into the example, I'm going to be adding some distortion to this drum track, but I'll play it clean just to start off with. So it sounds okay, but it is a little bit boring. The first thing I would recommend, which I don't usually recommend when mixing, is to solo the track. In this case, I really want to tune in to what is happening with the saturation. So for the sake of this example, I'm just going to be using this Ozone 9 Exciter plugin just because it lets me pick between some different types of saturation easily. Let's start experimenting with some of those different types of saturation. First, I'm going to use tube saturation. And what I want you to notice is that as I'm maybe increasing it up to around halfway, you might hear that the low mids start feeling a little bit more full and a little bit more reinforced. And then beyond there, it's just getting a lot brighter, a lot more high frequencies, and things actually start distorting and sounding almost clipped. So let's just take a listen for that. Sounding more reinforced and louder. But what was interesting was that even though things were distorting and sounding a lot louder, the peak loudness was actually going down on this dB meter, which is on the output. So as I increase it, we're getting less peak loudness, 
but the average loudness and the perceived loudness is increasing. And this is why I really wanted to explain that non-linear behavior at the start. Even just going a few more percent up here just radically changes how, uh, how this distortion sounds. Now, what is very common is, say, distorting something quite a lot and then pulling the mix down. So this means we're distorting it like crazy, but then we're only going to blend in actually a small amount of that crazy distortion. So let's experiment with that. So to me, that just sounds a little bit broken uh, for this particular track. I would pull it back like this. Let's try some different types of distortion. So this time I'm going to go to warm, and this should be a lot more subtle, but you'll feel that instead of adding a load of the high end, it's simply just reinforcing that kick and snare. It's pulling out the bottom of the snare, it's beefing up the kick drum a little bit. But you can hear that as we get to the higher frequencies, the hi-hats start sounding almost like some sort of reed instrument, they sort of start to flutter and break apart. So that's something to listen for in the high end, just as we push up to here. And I'm, I'm sorry if you're hearing all of this really obviously, but I do have a uh, an ear training series on my channel, so this is what I'm doing now. I'm just sort of talking through exactly what I'm hearing in the hope that you can sort of pick up on it too and, and train your ears. But if you're much more advanced than this, I'm really sorry, you might want to skip ahead. Now I'm going to swap over to tape. And what you'll hear is that it starts boosting the sort of high frequencies, so the, the mid and top of that snare and the hi-hats. I hear that it starts boosting them a little bit sooner than I hear with the tube uh, saturation. So let's start this. Even by the time I get to here, I'm hearing those hi-hats substantially louder. So what I'm going to do for this is the tube, because I don't want the top end to be so, uh, so boosted. But although it says tube, it's not just modeling a tube, it's probably modeling the whole circuitry that was in that tube device. I really want to highlight a tube on its own does not provide warmth. I mean, it, it, it glows really hot. It is warm. If you were to touch it, it would be hot. And that's exactly why companies get us with that marketing. The tube on its own is actually just inducing higher harmonics. It's the whole circuit and mainly the transformer that is adding all of that weight and sort of extra body and warmth to the signal. So now the crucial step. Once you've picked the type of saturation you want, this is when you kind of really need to turn everything else back on. And this is what you use to blend in the amount, because on its own, you'll almost always get the wrong amount of distortion, or at least I do every single time. Now if we listen with and without the saturation, you'll see that the one with the saturation is actually much more quiet in terms of peak loudness. It's 6 dB quieter, give or take, but the perceived loudness and the overall loudness, in my opinion, is a little bit higher, at least in these headphones. So let's take a listen. And I think that overall it's just a lot more interesting. So the way I like to use saturation in a mix, and I will get on to another example here, is usually just subtle. So every single track just have a little bit of saturation in there. It doesn't have to be in your face. Those drums were probably a little bit over the top. But especially when you're using saturation to reinforce a track or subtly support it, say with those extra second order harmonics, what you'll find is that if you use just a teeny little bit on say 10 or 20 tracks, all together, it sums together to a much more sort of punchy, much more full sounding mix. Now I'm going to go on to the guitar, which is an excellent example of why you should be blending in the saturation uh, with everything else playing. And what this saturation plugin lets me do is not really increase the loudness, but just add a little bit of grit, a little bit of texture to the guitar, whilst also keeping it pretty smooth. But more importantly, it just lets me hear the guitar without it having to stand out in the mix. So I'll play before and after the saturation. <laughs> 
this case, I think it lets the guitar sit a bit further back in the mix, yet it pulls all this detail up, all of those extra harmonic overtones are pulled up in the guitar, and it just sounds a little bit more cool, a little bit more textured, but again, it's not an in-your-face sort of screaming wall of guitars, it's just sort of a subtle amount of saturation. So that's the end of the examples, and that's all I've really got for this video, but I hope that it's clarified, you know, what is saturation, the difference between even and odd harmonics. Hope it's also shown you the difference in the non-linear behavior of that circuitry, and also maybe cleared up a few doubts or misconceptions about, you know, tubes and all that sort of marketing that's thrown in our face all the time. The type of saturation that's induced really is all down to the specific topology of the circuit, or the plugin that you're using. So the real take home from this uh, video is that you've just got to get your hands on a lot of these plugins, feed them a lot of signal, and just learn. You know, it takes a bit of time to tune your ears into these things, but you will learn the differences between all of these different types of saturation, and it's not, you know, rocket science at the end of the day. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please do let me know what you want to see in the next video, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.